All right, so hello and welcome again, everybody. This is the, the test started my SQL on Kubernetes seminar. And um, my name is Randy Abernathy. I am a CNCF ambassador and um, I'm a managing partner at RxM, Cloud Native Consulting and Training Shop. And we're basically here to hear Sugu, Sugu Moran's discussion about um, the test. Um, Sugu was one of the co-creators of the test at um, YouTube and um, now is the CTO of Planet Scale. And so, um, Sugu, if you would like, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Randy. Hi, so uh, just to uh, quickly give a background uh, about myself uh, and Vitesse. Um, we started uh, uh, working on Vitesse in 2010. So Vitesse is about nine years old uh, as a project. Um, it was actually born out of the need uh, that we had at YouTube where we were uh, managing many MySQL instances and it was beginning to go out of control. Uh, there were just too many outages and we were up against the wall. So uh, Mike, my co-creator and I decided to uh, think about what can we do to leap ahead of all the problems that we had, um, uh, we were currently facing. And essentially, that's how uh, Vitesse uh, was born. Uh, a quick background on what uh, Vitesse is, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is um, even though it started as a way to, um, to just take care of immediate problems that, in, immediate problems that we were facing at YouTube, uh, what it has now become is basically a full-fledged sharding middleware for MySQL. Uh, what that means is, is that um, if you install Vitess on your MySQL instance, uh, then you can shard it underneath. And as far as the application is concerned, you get the impression that you are still talking to a unified database. And uh, that's a huge uh, uh, win for a lot of people because uh, without something like Vitesse, uh, you have to make pretty big changes to your app if you, dis if you want to shard your database. Uh, so that is one big problem uh, that Vitesse solves. Uh, yeah, because of the fact that we were running it at YouTube, it is uh, naturally massively scalable. So any solution that we came up with had to scale into uh, millions of QPS and tens of thousands of uh, nodes. And also it had to be highly available, available which means that um, downtime beyond a few seconds is something that was, uh, was something that uh, someone, something like YouTube would not tolerate. Uh, so Vitesse comfortably gives you uh, five nines of uh, availability in most of the uh, production workloads that it is currently running. And last but not the least, Vitesse is cloud native. Uh, cloud native is actually a term that um, it's uh, somewhat of a buzzword, uh, but actually there are some very specific technical terms that you can use to evaluate whether a product is cloud native or not. And so I will go into um, some of the uh, very specific things that makes Vitesse cloud native. All right. Uh, so these are some of the stats about Vitesse. Like I said, it was started in 2010 and uh, has been gaining popularity. So initially, when, um, when we built, decided to start with this, uh, we open sourced it, but uh, it wasn't really, uh, the intent wasn't really to have other people adopt it. It was mostly because um, we wanted to um, expose the work that we had done and also not have to reinvent that wheel if we went somewhere else, right? And so it was mostly, we were uh, submitting code into the open source, but just, it was mostly just for YouTube's own sake. We used to just import that code back into YouTube and then uh, launch it inside. Uh, but in around 2015 or 16, uh, Flipkart found us and then they said, hey, it looks like this is something that we can also use. And so then they start, they worked on uh, adopting it and over time more and more companies came. And uh, today actually is uh, the, the biggest pride of uh, Vitesse is uh, who are the adopters of Vitesse. We have a pretty impressive list of um, technology leaders that um, are adopting Vitesse. Like here is some example. Uh, Slack is actually a major contributor to Vitesse and also a major adopter. 
uh, their intent is to actually fully migrate uh, to Vitas. And I think their goal is to do it by end of this year. At this point, they are 30% migrated. They actually talked about some of their stats uh, in our last meetup just a few days back. They said that they peaked at 1.2 million QPS. And uh, they even gave some number of shards. I think it was in the high hundreds. Um, or maybe a thousand, uh, uh, it's not shards, a uh, thousand instances, uh, nodes of uh, uh, with test nodes. Uh, Square Cache actually uh, is a classic case of um, uh, with test use where uh, they had a single instance MySQL uh, that was running on the biggest hardware they could buy, that money could buy, and uh, that was running out of uh, capacity. And what they did was they launched Vitas on top of that huge uh, database and then sharded it underneath. Uh, I believe they, uh, they are now at, uh, uh, the last number was that they were at 32 shards and were looking at going to 64. So the, one of their uh, uh, statement is that um, sharding is addictive uh, because once you shard, things run better. And then you say, oh, let's shard some more and let's shard some more. So it just keeps going, um, and you uh, and it's mostly a lot of gain with very little, little loss. And Pinterest actually recently um, migrated to Vitas, and uh, uh, one of their cool quotes is uh, like resharding is eventless, almost boring. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing um, that Vitas makes really, really easy uh, uh, for you to do. Um, so here is another thing. So um, uh, Cash App actually had, um, uh, which is from Square, grew so fast that um, uh, Jack Dorsey himself tweeted about it. Uh, so now the top two apps in the top charts uh, are using Vitas. And uh, we are going after Burger King next. <laughs> uh, cool. So here is a list of uh, some of the big adopters of uh, Vitas. This slide actually needs to be updated. There are a, a few more users that have uh, that are beginning to come on board, but we need to uh, get them to uh, list their logos, logos in here. These are the people that uh, have agreed to have their logos listed. Um, the, the most important takeaway from this is that Vitas runs in a large number of environments because each of these companies runs has a different uh, uh, production setup. Some are on bare metal, some are or, uh, on uh, cloud, uh, like uh, running EC2 instances. Some are running uh, Kubernetes. Uh, some are running other uh, cloud uh, orchestration software. Uh, there's at least one Vitas instance, I believe, that runs on Mesos. And there's another user that's looking at running it on uh, Nomad. So, um, and there is a reason for this is because um, uh, which I will go into, uh, which which is somehow related to uh, making with us uh, cloud native also. So uh, why is uh, Vitas cloud native? Why does Vitas uh, claim to be uh, so compatible uh, with Kubernetes? Is what we are going to uh, talk about. So this goes into the history of Vitas. So when we first developed Vitas. Uh, we were, uh, it was actually developed only for bare metal. But in 2013, um, uh, what happened, uh, and we were uh, running Vitas on bare metal in YouTube's own data centers. Uh, we were not part of uh, Google data centers. In 2013, uh, Snowden happened, and uh, Google pretty much mandated that uh, we are not allowed to have data, uh, sensitive data, outside of Google data centers itself, that we had to migrate everything inside Google's cloud. And uh, that faced a, a pretty big challenge because we test was open source and we were uh, running it on this bare metal. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many of you have worked at uh, Google, but if you develop software that runs inside Google's ecosystem, it is pretty much almost impossible to open source it. The reason is because Google has so many custom APIs, right? There is Chubby, there is Tubby, there's uh, all these logging APIs, monitoring APIs, and they are all internal to Google. So if you write, if you wrote software that ran inside uh, the Google's uh, Borg cloud, that is pretty much not open sourceable. 
But when we decided to port Vitesse into Google's Borg, we faced a challenge. We said, okay, do we just close source it and then rewrite Vitesse to use Google's internal APIs? Or do we try to keep it open source and somehow make it work inside Google's cloud? So we went for the latter decision. And it was really, really hard because what that meant was actually building abstraction layers for every API of Google that we were using, um, like throttling uh, and uh, whatever else that uh, uh, that was um, needed, right? Like uh, uh, calling into Borgmon, calling into Chubby, calling into Stubby. So we actually built abstraction layers for each of those things. And uh, that is how we finally managed to uh, get it working inside Borg. So one cool... Um, property of Vitesse that even, I believe not even a storage system inside Google has, is Vitesse ran as a stateless app in Google's Borg, which means that we just, as far as Google's cloud was concerned, Vitesse was just an app. Uh, it was not a special storage system with any privileges about uh, what it could do with storage. It was not, so other uh, storage systems in uh, Borg uh, were actually infrastructural elements, APIs that you could call into that Borg provided as an API for storage. Vitesse is the only system that ran, uh, ran as an app. So why that uh, story is important is because when Kubernetes came out, we were essentially ready for it because we, because we could run as an, as an app in a cloud, uh, all we had to do was uh, change our adapt, uh, ch change our layers to call into Kubernetes and we were ready. So which is the reason why uh, you can see here, Kubernetes 1.0 came out in July, but we actually announced that Vitesse was ready for Kubernetes before Kubernetes 1.0 came out. And uh, we went out and told people that you can use Vitesse on um, Kubernetes and um, uh, people started using it actually. Um, Stitch Labs was actually the first company to adopt and they were pretty running, uh, they are a small company, but they are running. They are running pretty high QPS. I think there is a, a Percona talk by Stitch Labs where they talk about uh, uh, running about 150,000 QPS, and they migrated their entire traffic into Vitesse in 2016. And so, which means that um, Vitesse has uh, the oldest Vitesse instance is now nearly three years old, and it has been serving. Uh, so they are 100% on Kubernetes, uh, on Vitesse, and on, on their own storage. And uh, it's been now going for uh, three years now. No incidents, no data loss. Um, and uh, so they've been pretty happy. Uh, then came HubSpot. Uh, well, the big work that they did was they actually did a lot of compatibility work to make a large number of queries work. Then JD.com came and uh, they actually uh, scaled it massively also. Um, so these, these companies have been running Vitesse on Kubernetes for many years now. So it is not a theory. Uh, it is now a proven thing and you can take this to the bank. So Nozzle is actually the last entrant that, start, uh, that migrated to Kubernetes. Their coolest story is that because they are fully on Kubernetes, they can move from one cloud to another whenever they want. In fact, they actually started, um, they started on Azure because Azure gave them huge credits and eventually they ran out of those credits and uh, within one hour, they migrated from Azure into um, uh, Google Cloud, uh, GCP. And uh, I don't know if they're running GKE or their own Kubernetes, most likely GKE, uh, but uh, that is how easy it is for you to migrate from one cloud to another if you are completely on Kubernetes end to end. So that's, uh, uh, that's one, uh, uh, one recommendation, which is if you uh, instead use a storage that is provided by the cloud like RDS or Cloud SQL, then migrating out of that is a lot harder. Whereas if you are 100% on Kubernetes, it is so easy to move. But then after all this, uh, here Kelsey keeps saying, don't move your storage to Kubernetes. It is problematic. Uh, run your stateless app on Kubernetes, but storage I would not recommend, right? Uh, but um, 
uh, that is the reason why he says that is because uh, of this. Essentially, what he's saying is, if you just took a storage system and just moved it to Kubernetes, you're going to regret it, because there are uh, there are things missing. There are, there are gaps between Kubernetes and the storage layer that need to be filled, and existing storage systems just don't run as is on Kubernetes. So that's essentially what he was trying to say. Um, and to explain why Vitesse bridges the gap, I'm going to show you the Vitesse architecture here. Um, the way Vitesse works is, even though it can scale really, really massively, the Vitesse architecture is fairly simple. It's just a two-layer architecture. Uh, you can see the app server here. It connects to uh, these VT gates. These VT gates are stateless app servers, so it can connect to any of them through a load balancer. And as far as the app server is concerned, uh, a VT gate represents your entire cluster. It's as if it's connected to a single MySQL instance. But under the, under the covers, what VT gate does is when you send a query to it, it actually has a metadata called the V schema, which is kind of a schema, but for a sharded system. And it uses that schema to figure out where that query should go. And then once it figures it out, it sends it to a VT tablet. And each VT tablet runs its own MySQL instance. And what this VT tablet does is actually uh, completely manage that MySQL instance. And, uh, the, uh, and also it has other benefits like connection pooling. Uh, it can also do housekeeping work like um, backups and restores and uh, those kinds of things. You can see here that there are many types of uh, VT tablets. There is a master VT tablet which accepts writes. And there are some replica VT tablets that accept uh, read traffic, uh, et cetera. So this is one case, um, uh, one architecture, which you cannot uh, directly get if you moved your MySQL to Kubernetes. So let's say you want to uh, move, uh, you want to deploy MySQL on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, uh, the, the best, uh, um, the best uh, pod type to use is a stateful set, right? The stateful set a workload gives you the ability to have a, a bunch of instances. But what the stateful set does not allow you to do is designate one of those instances as a master, right? As far as Kubernetes is concerned, they are all equal. So if you want to designate one pod as a master, what you have to do is actually uh, pull that out into a separate pod type. Right? And if you did that, then that pod becomes a master and then the rest of the pods become replicas. So then you can say, okay, so, uh, direct traffic to the master pod, direct traffic to the replica. But then what happens if a master goes down, right? If a master goes down, then you cannot fail over to a replica and say, now this pod is designated at mass, as a master. So Kubernetes doesn't allow you to change a pod type on the fly which means that you have to wait for the master to be restarted, so to, for Kubernetes to restart that pod as a master. And then once it comes back up, then you can send traffic to it. So in other words, if you deployed just MySQL and did this type of separation, uh, then uh, you cannot really have a high, highly available system because if a master goes down, you are pretty much out of luck. And the only way you can solve it is to, and the way Vitesse solves it is because it has this VT gate in the middle, it can actually track where the master is. And if a master goes down, we can reparent and designate an existing replica as a master. And then immediately VT gate can switch uh, to that replica and start sending traffic. And this can happen literally within seconds. And even during those seconds, what VT gate does is it actually doesn't return errors to the app server. It just waits for the new master to be elected. So the only thing the app server notices is a brief latency spike. And uh, the other problem is um, databases like MySQL perform best when their storage is local. Right? So, but, the, uh, but the problem with Kubernetes is if you use the local storage, then as soon as your um, uh, pod is uh, shut down, Kubernetes wipes all your data, right? And so in this case, um, uh, that is kind of scary for anybody uh, running on MySQL. So most people that 
uh, have so far moved MySQL to Kubernetes have ended up using a uh, mounted uh, a volume like EBS or a CSI uh, based volume that uh, gives its own persistence uh, guarantees. There is still now, there is now a local PV that Kubernetes supports, uh, but it hasn't seen uh, much production use yet. And it still has a limitation that unless your, uh, uh, your, uh, the pod gets rescheduled on the same node, you still don't have access to that. The way Vitas solves this problem is it actually does not rely on the local data ever being present. So if a pod goes down, what Vitas can be made to do is to always say, well, if, if, a, if a new pod comes up, always go to a, um, to a backup, restore from that backup, and then after you've restored, point it to the master, let it catch up, and after it has caught up, then start serving traffic. So basically, Vitas does not rely on uh, local data being preserved uh, for, uh, for its uptime. And uh, we, there is an additional feature in MySQL called semi-sync replication that guarantees that um, uh, when a transaction gets committed, at least one other replica has it. So which means that you will never lose a transaction uh, if a pod goes down. You can run with tests to also use a mounted storage and some people do run it. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but you can also run it in this uh, high performance, high availability mode uh, where uh, you use local data and then if a pod goes down, just throw it away and then bring up a new pod, restore from replica and keep moving forward. Um, and how reliable is this uh, methodology? This is how Vitesse runs in Google Cloud. Uh, in the Borg, we, we have never ever restored uh, a crashed MySQL. We always threw it away and then uh, brought up new new instances. And this is where and this is where running um, a sharded MySQL makes more sense. If uh, so, we don't run huge instances. All our instances are like two to three hundred gigs of data size, which means that if a pod goes down, a new pod comes back up and is ready to serve within like a few uh, like five or ten minutes. So that's how long it takes for a new pod to be spun up. So this is what makes uh, Vitas cloud cloud native, right? And uh, the final one is obviously the discovery mechanism where there is this topology where VT tablet, when it comes up, it registers itself with the topology and these VT gets discover them as uh, new things uh, come up. And last but not the least, uh, it works across multiple cells. So you can have a full worldwide deployment of Vitas uh, running tens of thousands of nodes. All right. Uh, moving forward, um, we, you can actually um, uh, start using Vitesse right from the beginning. Uh, it gives you benefits uh, even if you have a single instance of MySQL uh, because uh, you, it gives you connection pooling, it gives you deadlines. It makes overall your MySQL run better. Um, but then as you scale, you start to be, uh, using more and more features of Vitesse uh, the Vitas distributed system capabilities. It can route to replicas, it can do load balance, it can do master promotion. And then eventually you can shard your system. And, uh, as, and as you shard your system, as far as the app is concerned, you still get a unified view and uh, eventually end up into a fully worldwide deployment. So this is how you would grow with Vitas. And as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, I wouldn't want to say that app servers are completely unaffected. Sometimes you, when you distribute things, you do have to rewrite things uh, in the app because uh, you are making trade-offs in performance and not everything will continue to work that, like it used to work before, but the impact is definitely uh, minimized. All right, so I am going to show a demo. And if I have time at the end of the demo, I will talk about uh, the regret feature which is um, when you decide to shard a system, you have to make some trade-offs and decisions. And sometimes those decisions are not the right ones. So the latest feature that we developed allows you to actually reshard your system using a different key, uh, which is why it's called the regret feature. So I will talk about that at the end if I have time. So here's the demo I'm going to show. Uh, this is actually the use cases, let's say we are building a marketplace where we allow merchants to sell products to customers, uh, something like Amazon. So 
this is a simplified schema where you have a product table, which has a list of products, a uh, customer table where all the uh, customers are stored, and a merchant table that has all the merchants, and merchants list uh, uh, their products. The customer comes in and they say, when they place an order, an order row is created, and this order row has foreign keys, which means that there is an order ID, which is its own ID. The CID, which is the customer ID, points back to the customer that placed the order. The PID is a product that they bought, and the M name, which is the merchant name, is the merchant from which they bought the product from. So if you scale this massively, you're going to have billions of orders, you're going to have uh, uh, maybe a billion customers, millions of merchants, and uh, thousands of thousands of products, right? And then when you decide to shard the system, you are kind of forced to split it into three databases. Uh, one is the product database, which contains the product. One is the customer database for the customer and the merchant database. Uh, because they have different keys, different root keys. The orders table is a decision that you have to make about where to put it. You can say that orders can be with merchant or orders can be with customer or orders can be in its own shard if that is a decision that's also a, a, an option. And each one has a different trade-off. So if you say that an order can be with customer, uh, then you uh, then it's uh, easy to join a customer with order. You can easily query whether uh, you can, a customer can come in and say, show me all my orders, or you can say, uh, show me all the orders for group by customer. So you can do those kinds of queries, but it becomes harder to query, for example, what's the product description for a customer because the product description information is in this database. Or if a merchant comes in and says, oh, I need to find out all my orders, then it becomes a rather complicated query because you have to go to each customer shard and uh, find out all, basically essentially do a scan of all shards. So in this case, I'm going to assume that the product is unsharded because the product table is small. A customer has to be sharded because they are massive and the merchant is also uh, sharded. So uh, I'm going to uh, accelerate uh, and uh, uh, show you some pretty cool things we can do with Vitesse. Uh, but uh, unlike these stunts, these are stunts that you can try at home. So I'm going to bring up a, uh, so I already have a cluster that I've brought up. Uh, I can show you the cluster here. So this cluster is the same cluster that I uh, showed in, in my slide. It has uh, one product shard. It has two merchant shards and uh, two customer shards. The 80 it means that it's a hexadecimal, so eight is in the middle. So which means that zero to eight is uh, one shard and eight to infinity is the other shard. So in this, uh, and I have an app here. Uh, this is my app, uh, my e-commerce application, except it is very raw. Uh, what you have to do is you have to imagine that you're a customer and when you sign up, you go and uh, execute the query to insert yourself into this customer. If you place an order, you have to execute the query to insert an order into the table. It's kind of a pretend application, but the cool part of it is you can, basically this app allows you to send random queries to this Vitas sharded system. And as uh, it executes, it shows you what it does. So, just to prime our, um, uh, I have this, uh, uh, let me show you, um, uh, for example, what a V schema looks like. So here is a V schema. A V schema basically is a schema, is a description of how a system is sharded. For example, for the merchant uh, key space, this is the V schema, where it says that the merchant key space uh, has a, a prior, is sharded by merchant name and it uses, uh, in Vitesse, we have these things called, called Vindexes, which are essentially the sharding key that not only define which column it is sharded by, but also how to, what algorithm to use to shard. In this case, I'm going to use a Unicode uh, MD5 sharding key, okay? Uh, and uh, I have some data here. Uh, you can, I have some pre-cooked statements that insert data uh, into this database. I'm going to run my MySQL client against VTGate and say, import all this data. 
And then if I go and refresh this page, all my data is imported in here. Uh, you can see that they are, uh, there are different colors. Every time a new row appears, that row uh, is highlighted by this app. This is just for convenience. So if I refresh this, everything will go blue. So here's some data. So as you saw, those are just regular MySQL, regular insert statements, but they went to different charts, like Sugu went to dash 80, Demer went to 80 dash. Uh, and, uh, but you can see that the orders for Sugu are within uh, Sugu's chart and the orders for Demer are within uh, Demer's chart. The foreign key is the CID, which is the customer ID, ID one. And in this case, ID six, which is the uh, Demer chart. Uh, and now I can run uh, queries here. Uh, if I say select star from product. So as far as uh, the app is concerned, this is one database, even though it is now split into three, into five different databases. Uh, if I say select star from product, uh, what we test as here, it shows the executed queries. It says, oh, product, it knows that it is in the product database. It says, I'm going to execute on product and I'm going to send this query. If I say select star from customer, uh, that is actually a scatter query because uh, customer is a sharded database. It sends it to both shards of the customer and then sends you uh, the result. If I did a join of the customer with the order table, you can see that I'm saying customer join with orders on the customer ID as a foreign key. Uh, this query with us knows that since all the orders are of customer are within each shard, it knows that it doesn't have to do anything crazy. It basically pushes on that entire join into each of the shards and then returns uh, the query. So this is uh, the uh, Vitesse's uh, query routing capabilities. However, if I did this query, so what this query is doing is, is joining customer with orders and then going to product and says, fetch the product description for each of those orders and please display that. So that is something of a cross chart query. So what we test will do, I'm going to execute it and then explain what it did. So what we test here does is actually splits that query into two parts. And the first query is a join of the customer with order. And as I showed before, it's a within chart query. Uh, so that part of the query runs as a scatter query. And then it receives three rows that came as output. And for each of those rows, it has to make a round trip into the product uh, database to fetch the description, which is actually the three queries that you see that went into the product. So this is, uh, so this works in Vitesse, but it is not optimal. And uh, here Vitesse gives you an option, a solution, which actually no other sharded system gives that I know of, which is uh, this product table is small. What if we could just copy this product table inside each of the shards of this customer, then we can tell with test to say, hey, join with the local product, uh, then this query will uh, be executed extremely efficiently. So uh, we have this new feature that is called the materialized view. You can say materialize product into, materialize any table into any other table using certain rules. Right? So I'm going to give you, uh, uh, that materialize command. So here is the command, right? So here I say, I'm going to materialize uh, the product dot product table into customer dot product. And it is a reference table. What that means is that I'm going to materialize all the rows into each of the shard, which means that it is not a sharded table. It's an unsharded table with identical copies within each shard. I say, I also want the table to be created because the table currently doesn't exist. So I'm going to execute this. So as soon as I execute this and then refresh it, the product table has materialized. You can see that it has copied these rows. The one thing you should remember is that this table can be multiple terabytes, which means that this materialization process can take a while. It can take a few hours, maybe even days. And during that time, this table is not visible. So if I uh, continue, if I reissue this query, uh, it will still go, uh, it will still behave as if this product table doesn't exist. But once this materialization is done and this table is caught up, 
I can now go say, expose that materialized view to the application, right? So I say, uh, oh, did I, did I do something wrong? Uh, oh, not merchant. It should be, sorry. I did a copy pasta problem. Oh, it's the other one. <laughs> expose, yeah. So expose this. Um, so I, when I created the materialized, I named this as a workflow. I use that workflow to make changes to it. And I say expose whatever the effects of that workflow to the application. Now I'm going to re-execute the same exact query. And now you can see that it is, the plan has changed. It is now running it as a fully, uh, as a scatter query where it is joining with the local product itself. I can still say that I want to specifically join with a product table and, and that is possible. And so this is, uh, so this is actually a very powerful feature because things that were extremely inefficient can be made super efficient by just through, through this materialization feature. And if, and the more important thing is if I make changes to the source table, so now I'm going to insert a new product. So as soon as I insert it, uh, immediately that row is replicated into these target tables. All right. So now the next query is what if the merchant wants to look at all their orders? That's even harder query to uh, implement because it's actually a full scatter on all the merchants. And for each row that I received, it is a full scatter on the um, uh, customer key space, right? So that's, that's a query that's basically unimaginably expensive. Uh, and again, the question is, what if we materialize this orders table into the merchant table? So in the case of a product table, it was easy, right? You just copied all the rows. But in the case of a merchant table, you can't just copy all the rows. Uh, because one is uh, order is sharded by customer ID on, and on this side for this materialization to work effectively, it needs to be sharded by uh, M name, which is actually the sharding key for merchant. So Vitas allows you to do that also, which is essentially saying materialize merchant, uh, the customer.orders into merchant.orders, but when you materialize, use a different sharding key and also create table, right? So now I'm going to execute it. So if you see that, I refresh it here. And uh, you can see that this table has materialized, but you can see that the rows are not the same way as they are in the source. You can see that um, now all mono price rows are in the mono price shard and the new egg rows are in the new egg shard. All right, and uh, now if I, uh, now I'm going to, uh, as you saw, I need to expose this. The expose uh, in the demo, it, it feels like an extra step, but in production, you need to actually do these as two steps uh, because you have to wait for the materialization to finish and then you have to expose it. So now that I've exposed it, I mean, if I rerun that same query, it now becomes a simple uh, cross chart query, uh, a simple, yeah, a simple cross chart query. In the previous case, it was a multiple nested loop join, uh, very expensive. All right. So if you look at um, so uh, if you look at uh, the the underlying feature that helps you do this is called the v-replication feature. The first case we actually copied all the rows. In the second case, we applied filters to these rows and said, uh, send some rows here, send some rows there. Uh, what else can you do with vReplication? So vReplication not only allows you to materialize and filter, it also allows you to transform. Uh, what does transform mean is that you can specify basically a select query as an expression, as a transformation expression. And, uh, uh, and the select query can be actually can have aggregations and sub, which means that you can actually create real-time rollups. Uh, so here is an example of a real-time rollup. Uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, materialize. Uh, uh, this is again the same materialize command, but here what I have done is instead of giving a uh, target table, I say uh, it, I gave a target expression saying that materialize sales as this expression. So in this case, I'm going to select 
product ID and uh, the number of orders and the total price for each order. And I say materialize it as a sales table. And now I'm going to also expose it. Expose it. Now if I refresh it, there is a sales table that has popped up that has automatically rolled up all the orders into their counts and amounts. And then I can now run queries directly into uh, the sales table. And if you actually, uh, you can actually watch this row, I'm going to change an order. Uh, am I going to, yeah, let's say I'm going to add an order here. If I add an order, see what happens. The order was added here. That added order was replicated into the merchant key space and the sales amount has been updated accordingly uh, with the total of all orders. And all this happens efficiently because of how vReplication works is because this happens by uh, where vReplication subscribes to the bin logs and just basically looks at each event and applies just the incremental change to the target tables. So it is very efficient and very fast. The only downside is that it is uh, eventually consistent, which means that if there is a network partition between customer and product, then uh, the sales table will be delayed in its update. So that is the trade-off for uh, this feature. And uh, just before concluding, um, the vReplication feature that we use uh, can also be used for the regret feature that I talked about. If you looked at, uh, if you flip the story around where you say, let's say I, I chose a CID for the orders and I did not like the key, I could have created a workflow that migrated orders into the merchant orders and then rekeyed it by monoprice. And all I had to tell Vitesse is instead of sending rights to customers, switch the rights to merchant. And now I've resharded a table that was uh, sharded one way into a table that was sharded uh, another way. So going back to our uh, uh, concluding remarks is the, there are many use cases that we are going to deploy with Vitesse. Uh, materialized views, real-time roll-ups, and resharding uh, is what I talked about. But you can use uh, this Findex, uh, this vReplication feature for schema deployments, data migrations, backfilling of tables, and also change notification where you can subscribe to see um, uh, what changes are going through uh, inside my uh, database. So that's uh, that concludes my presentation. I am now open for questions. Awesome. Super awesome. Thanks, Sugu. Um, the test is very cool. So we've got a bunch of um, a bunch of questions in the Q&A. Let me just kind of run through here. Um, so one of the first ones uh, from Gene is um, what versions of MySQL and or other targets are supported uh, by the test? Oh, yes. Uh, good question. The test supports um, MySQL 5.6 uh, all the way up to 8.0. It supports uh, MariaDB 10.x, all versions of 10.x, all versions of Percona. Vitesse can also run on all cloud databases like uh, RDS and uh, Cloud SQL. So it's a pretty wide range of, uh, the only restrictions it has is that you need to have a row-based replication and GTID turned on. So any MySQL or MariaDB that supports those two features, it can run on. Gotcha. And any other uh, tricky combinations, um, you know, kind of interesting versions of MySQL with other storage engines or anything like that uh, been used at all? Oh, yes. Uh, we have some proof of concepts uh, where we were able to run uh, MySQL as well as MariaDB against uh, RocksDB. Uh, and, um, and some people have actually run it in production. Uh, as far as I know, there was no Vitesse limitation itself. Those who ran it on production uh, recently migrated to InnoDB because RocksDB itself has some limitations. So if MySQL with RocksDB will work for you, you can totally run Vitesse on it. Awesome, great, thanks. Um, okay, let's see. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit to just try to make sure we get as many different people represented here as possible in, in the time that we've got. Um, next, um, Next question is, what, what is the benefit of using Vitesse um, over, say, Amazon MySQL? The main difference is, uh, um, I would say scalability is definitely the, the biggest one. Uh, the, the Amazon's MySQL, even Aurora, 
uh, beyond certain limit would not scale for you. Whereas uh, with us, you can keep scaling forever. Uh, another big advantage is even if you can scale with Amazon, uh, with uh, things like RDS and Aurora, uh, you don't necessarily get to choose um, the instance size that you like, right? Once you grow beyond a certain size, you cannot really split your database within Amazon itself. In that case, you can still bring Vitess in and uh, run uh, your database sizes at a sweeter spot uh, that you would like to have. Uh, and But then the biggest one is the cloud native nature of Vitess is that you can run Vitess within your Kubernetes instance end to end, which gives you huge migration uh, uh, advantages. So whereas if you use something like uh, RDS, you are kind of stuck within that cloud. Right, and you know, I would imagine that because with the tests, you can tailor your sharding to your actual application patterns, that even on a um, apples to apples comparison, you know, uh, scale wise, you could potentially get some pretty fantastic performance benefits. Yes, totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also it, uh, uh, with the connection pooling features, it runs your MySQL much cooler. And also, um, the biggest uh, nightmares of DPAs is these sudden um, uh, overload spikes. Uh, and Vitas handles them really, really well. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but I, the, the, there was a recent outage on Slack, and they said Vitas just didn't even blink. Fantastic. <laughs> I'd like to hear that. Um, all right, so the next one. Um, Hmm. Okay, so um, so I, I think the question is around replication. Um, that, that it says how frequently is data backed up, but I think really it's uh, you know it's it's asking about the replication um, and um, if the master goes down, um, you know, is any data lost? So maybe yeah. So that's a good question. At the talk, but go ahead. Yeah, it depends on actually your sensitivity. So you can run with us in a way that you will not lose any data. Uh, both uh, whether you are using uh, mounted storage or local storage, you can configure Vitesse to not use any data. So if you are using local storage, uh, then uh, semi-sync replication is highly recommended, which means that uh, if you configure it that way, uh, no commit will be considered complete until one other replica at least has that data, which means that if you lose that master, you are guaranteed to be able to fail over to another master and find that transaction that completed. Or you could use um, uh, mounted storage, but if you use mounted storage, you definitely have to run with uh, the conservative settings of uh, MySQL where every commit is flushed into the storage. Uh, in that case, you will not lose data. And uh, uh, the somewhat sad part is that if you configure it that way, it does slow you down even further. Right. Yeah. And I, so I would imagine that basically the only way to lose data is to lose every single replica in at the, the same time in yeah. the shard at the same time, right? Yeah. In that case, at the same time. So the uh, so typically what I would recommend is if you are using um, like if your workload has a large number of replicas anyway because you have uh, you are running uh, uh, a lot of read traffic and if you are cross sell uh, because you uh, you need that then local storage is by far a huge win. Uh, not only will you, are you going to get huge performance benefits, uh, the fact that you have these many replicas gives you huge survivability. Uh, so it is very hard to lose. The more and more replicas you have, and the more replicas you have cross-sell, uh, it is almost impossible to lose all your data. Right. Uh, whereas if you are smaller, uh, where you need only one master and nothing else, you send all your queries to one master, in that case, it is recommended that you go with mounted storage. That is uh, a much more cost-effective way of running with this. Right, right. You know, I um, I was really intrigued by the whole kind of materialized sort of master data distribution approach. That's um, that's that's super slick, and especially the fact that you can have different you know partition keys on the the data set. You know, to make it you know fit with the uh, with the model of the, the parent, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. And I'm, I'm guessing that in this case, 
that all of the replicated data there, I mean, you, even if you had the, the exact partition, same partition key, that these, these uh, materialized guys, they, they're not eligible for election, right? They're just, they're just copies of the data. Correct, correct. They are, they, are, they are to be treated as copies, but you could, um, um, you could go through a, uh, so the, there are two workflows that we plan to support. One is this materialization on an almost identical workflow, which is actually a, a migration, right? So instead of saying materialize, if you say migrate, the exact same thing happens in, but in that case, what it allows you to do is actually cut over your rights to the other table. Right. So, so you materialize that becomes the master and vice versa. Yeah. So it is a fail, it is a failover in that case, but it is not a, it is not meant for unplanned. Uh, right. recovery. It is more of a planned thing where that it's not really efficient for me to write data in this format. I, it's more efficient to do it that way. So it's more for a planned uh, scenario. Yeah. It, but but it, it also is, like the cover data that you really lost. wonderful ability for you to explore like what is going to be more efficient and then just sort of like, you know, learn as you go. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of arguments that people have about how to shard things, sometimes they get very heated. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so this at least lets you uh, at least says, well, we'll do it this way. And if things break, we can go, we can always change our mind. Yeah. It's, it's a lot like microservices, right? You want to be able to iteratively discover the right architecture. Yeah, exactly. Cool stuff. Okay, let's see. Um, so how about a, a general kind of commentary on latency um, in big deployments? Oh, yes, that's a good one. So the way, uh, so Vitas adds a static overhead uh, because it is, uh, which is actually basically the number of hops that you have to uh, go through before you reach MySQL. Uh, it is typically about two milliseconds. Uh, so if, uh, yeah. So if your query, um, some people uh, are, do are sensitive to it. Those that are used to directly sending to MySQL and MySQL responds in a millisecond, then this suddenly is three milliseconds. But most people uh, find it absorbable because typical uh, MySQL latency runs in the five to 10 millisecond range per query. And in that case, this is something that uh, you won't even notice. Yeah, so you're seven to 12 or something. Yeah. And I would imagine if you get into a massive scatter gather operation, the test crushes MySQL. Yes, totally. That's because yeah. uh, when you do scatter gather, uh, now it's all parallel. Right. Yeah. So you can run 8, 10, 30, 30x faster than you ran before. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, there's a question about joins across shards, which I think maybe that happened before you demoed all that. Um, how about. Um, Let's see. Um, so there's a question here on, are the demo scripts available somewhere so that people could, you know, maybe retry your examples and stuff? Yes, I, uh, I uh, just pushed my latest branch into SSV demo six, which is on the planet scale. Uh, let me show you. Uh, I'll show it on the screen and maybe you can uh, post it later. Uh, so branches. Uh, so this, so the entire demo that I showed is in, in, uh, in this branch of, um, of Pitas. Uh, so if you can see my screen, uh, that's where it is. And, uh, maybe I can send it to you. If you send me an email, I can send you the link to this, uh, Great. branch. Yeah. I think there's like a summary email that comes up after. And so maybe we can drop it in there, get it out to everybody that way. Um, maybe we've, We've got time for maybe one more question. There's a lot of people um, interested in, um, now that you've got them so excited about the test, they're like, hey, can I use this with other database engines? Like uh, when's Postgres support coming and you know, other <laughs> databases. So can you comment on that? So yes, Vitas architecturally is not married to MySQL. Uh, it is mostly an engine that looks at SQL and decides where to send it and what to do with the results. So. There is nothing architectural that prevents Vitas from being ported to MySQL, uh, from Vitas to be ported to Postgres. Uh, it's just that we have had our hands full with uh, so much MySQL people asking for features that we haven't had time to spend to uh, port it to Postgres. But it's definitely, and as more and more people are asking, we are beginning to think that maybe we should do this 
sooner than later. If, if a community member um, got really excited about this, how many man hours do you think they'd have to put in to build the MySQL shim? Um, and is that easy? Is, it, is the test built to be able to be pluggable there? I mean, I know you mentioned a lot of the other kind of facades that you could drop in, but is that one of them? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I would estimate something like six, uh, six to 12 person months. So if you okay. people on it, maybe in six months, they can have Vitesse on Postgres would be my guess. Got it's it. very rough, very, very back of the envelope, but that would be my guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, a, a four people working hardcore could get it done in a quarter. Uh, yes, but then they, uh, the, there is the ramp up time. <laughs> right. So Christmas, we expect it by Christmas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, it is uh, top of the hour again. So thanks. It was super awesome. Uh, you know, the test, great stuff. And thanks for the fantastic presentation. Hope everybody enjoyed. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I feel like we, you know, covered a good swath of them. So um, great show and um, hope to see you uh, doing another talk on the test soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care. Bye, everybody.